spring day. A little damp. It's good. I brought out all the vegetables and fruits and trees and people and yeah, thanks. better days are coming right the sun will shine that's a promise we have well we're in uh, Matthew 21 this morning the triumphal entry that's what is titled in my Bible that's a, a nice thought you know I Jesus made a triumphal entry into my life. That's, that's what I think of whenever I see this. And you know, the next thing that happens, he cleanses the temple. You know, and that's what happened next with me too. We get in, and then he cleaned the house. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit this morning. So let's pray, and we'll get into the Word together. Father God, we, we're just grateful that you sent Jesus. And, and Lord, you revealed the truth of who he was to us. And Lord, now we have the hope of eternal life. We are so grateful, Lord. What we look at this morning is the beginning of his Passion Week, the beginning of the end for his time here on earth, physically, until he returns again. But Lord, we have that promise. We have that hope that he will come. And I believe soon. I believe you're coming quickly. And Lord, we, we just echo the, the song earlier, come, Jesus, come, come. Soon, come quickly. But until you come, Lord, may we be found <clears throat> faithful. Pray, Lord, you would bless our time as we look into your word, that you would speak to our hearts. You would help us, Lord, to just put away any hindrances, any distractions that might crowd in, and help us, Lord, just to hear what you would say to your church this morning. So bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I think about this, you know, Jesus... I mean, the first thing he says, now when they drew near Jerusalem, and you know, we talked about this last week in chapter 20, verse 17, it says, Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and discourage and to crucify and the third day he will rise again. So he knows what's coming. And that's courage, isn't it? That's boldness. Knowing what's going to happen, he's headed to Jerusalem. Now, if I knew that was coming at me, I'd be headed from Jerusalem. When you think about that, to be mocked, that's bad enough. But then, scourge. They take bits of glass and bone and stuff and put it on the end of leather whip and just... I mean, pummel you. Turned his back into hamburger. That's what they did to him. And he knew that was coming. And then the ultimate thing, to be put on a cross. You know, Scripture tells us, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. To become a curse and to know that. And then beyond even that, knowing for the first time, something I don't get, I don't understand. How does this happen? But to have him separated, the Son of God separated from the Father. How does that even happen? You know, but that's what he knows is coming. The most horrific thing that he could experience, and yet he's headed for it because he knew it's the only way that you and I could spend eternity with him. Sin had to be paid for. And he's the only one that could pay for it. And so he's headed because of his love for us. You know, we read that in Hebrews 12. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Despising the shame, he hated it. He didn't want to do it. He despised it. Yet, there's joy beyond the cross. And for that joy, and that joy is you. That joy is me. That's what it is. It's fellowship with us. And so he's going for it. He's coming, and he's not sneaking into town either. He's right in your face, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, whoever you are. I'm coming. And so that's what we read about. It says here in chapter 21, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. 
all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly, and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of the donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So here he comes, you know, great pomp, great circumstance, coming into Jerusalem. Starts out, though. And yes, he purposely fulfilled scripture, but this is it. He said, Go, guys, I need a couple of you. Most think it was uh, Peter and John. Go get me a colt. He's fulfilling the scripture from Zechariah 9 9, which is what we have here in verse 5. Coming on a colt, and I'm just thinking about that. You know, I mean, a colt, I mean, today, a donkey, we don't use them as much. They're like the pickup truck, right? The pickup truck of the day, that's what we use now. But even though he's coming in a pickup, he's not coming in a, a, a decked out Silverado or an F 150 or 250 or 350 or how many 50s they got. He always getting himself a little two-wheel drive Chevy S10. That's what he's come in on. A little colt, you know? A little baby of a... Never been ridden on. Luke tells us that. It's a donkey that had never been ridden on before. Just a little thing. You know, if you're coming in as a conquering king, which is what the people are looking for, you're on a white horse. You're in the Mercedes. You're in a Cadillac. You're in something fancy, something shiny. Big white horse. That's going to happen. That's in Revelation 19. He's got a white horse. Amen. He's coming on that. But here, no, he's coming humbly. He's coming in humility. He's coming as the suffering servant. Coming to declare how much God loves us. And yes, fulfilling scripture, fulfilling prophecy. You mentioned uh, John 14, 29 last week. How Jesus said, I, I'm going to tell you things before they occur, so that when they do occur, you will believe that I am he. So that we will believe. See, that's what prophecy is all about. 27, 28% of the Bible is prophecy. Much of it then fulfilled. Fulfilled precisely, exactly like this. Coming lowly on the foal of a donkey, a colt, a little donkey. He's coming to town. Not threatening, not with an army, not coming in to the, the rulers in Jerusalem that hate him. Not coming to them, trying to overthrow them, trying to challenge them in any way. No, just coming. Uh, announcing his arrival, though, certainly. Because when the disciples go into town, I believe as they went in there to get the, the colt, they spread the word, hey, Jesus is coming. You know, that's part of how the multitude get out there to greet him. They heard he was coming. He's coming. And not only was uh, Zechariah 9, 9 fulfilled, but this prophecy in Psalm 118, and that's when they cried out Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means save now. Save now to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Say now, in the highest, save us, Lord. You know, that's what people were crying out. But it's, it's one of the Hillel Psalms, one of the Psalms they often share at Passover at that time of year. And so here's this great multitude. And, you know, they don't have a red carpet to roll out, but they have their clothes. They take them off. They put them down, you know, worshiping Jesus. And he received their worship. Those who ran out of clothing, you know, no more jackets, let's cut off branches, we're throwing those down. I mean, it was a very celebratory, very uh, praise-filled greeting to the Lord as he comes into Jerusalem. And Hosanna, just thinking about that word, save now. 
That's what they wanted, salvation. See, they're, they're living under Roman occupation. And things are hard. And they wanted the Lord to come. See, they understood the Old Testament scriptures about the conquering king. And Gene and I were talking yesterday, and I'm reading about this a little bit. You know, well, how could these same people that are crying this out here just a few days later say, crucify him, away with him? You know, how could they do that? Uh, Alfred Edersheim, in his book, uh, Jesus in His Times, uh, something like that's the title. But anyway, he said most of the people that were here and crying this were people from away. They were not the residents of Jerusalem. Because in Jerusalem, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those guys had stirred everybody up, and they hated Jesus. He didn't go through their schools, see. He wasn't trained by them. He's an outsider. And so they had this attitude automatically against him. I've seen that in other ways. I, I, just thinking about those at home school. You know, you're, off you're offending teachers. That's what happens, because I've talked to a lot of teachers. Well, I can't teach as well as we can in the school. No, actually, statistically, the best education a kid can have is homeschooling. That's the best. Now, if you can't do that, I'm grateful that we have schools where kids can go, certainly. The best option after homeschooling is a Christian school. That'd be a great thing. But if that's not possible, well, they've got to go to school, but... You've got to be involved. You've got to know what's going on there, certainly. Because the schools, um, in some places, not everywhere, but some of them are really a mess. Some of them are teaching some really crazy stuff. And they're being forced more and more to teach things about gender and gender identity and, you know, all that stuff. That's who. And if the equality act that the Congress approved or the House approved Friday were to pass the Senate if the president were to sign it boy, it would be in deep deep trouble but fortunately I don't think that will happen I don't think it will get through the Senate I know the president won't sign it because it has nothing to do with equality it makes every ridiculous idea of man have equal validity with the spoken and revealed word of God and we just can't have that and I don't think it'll happen. If it would, uh, it's a severe, severe attempt to silence the word of God in our, our land. That's what it is, ultimately. It's a, a ploy of the devil. That's what it is. But hopefully, and I think most assuredly it won't pass, at least not now. I don't know about after our current president is no longer in office. Who knows? We're seeing that in our own state right now. Some of the things coming down because we have a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic governor. And they are spending money and having a grand old time trying to do that. That's crazy. But you know, Jesus, he didn't go to their schools, so they, they hated him there. But a lot of the outsiders, you know, they like, man, whatever, he, you know, they like him. They, they're aware of, is it, you know, all the healings he's done, all the good things he's done. They have no real issue with him. But how did they cry out, crucify him a week later? Um, Alfred Edersheim's thought was that the Pharisees and the Sadducees stirred them up, were able to convince them. Well, say, I, I don't know that I, I mean, partially maybe that's it, but I think some of it perhaps was the fact that they're crying saved now. See, they wanted to be saved from the occupation uh, of Rome. And when Jesus comes in and he's not there and driving the leadership out, he's not coming to conquer Rome, and then, in fact, he does get arrested, he has a trial, and he is mocked and then scourged, and he's standing there before Pilate, and they look at him. I think they see a very weakened a very uh, poor symbol of their hero. And because of that, I think it's real easy as a crowd begins, you know, that crowd mentality as they begin to shout, crucify him, and everybody just joins in with that. I think it's more of a mob mentality where everybody just kind of jumps on board 
because what they're looking at is not at all what they expected. And so they cry out to crucify him. But save now, you know, thinking about that as well. How many people have put themselves in bondage and have cried that, cried out that, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus, save now. You know, I've become addicted to drugs or gambling or sex or I have unholy desires for power or possessions or fame or my flesh is too strong, I'm spiritually weak, I hurt. No one understands, I'm lost, I'm lonely, I'm longing. Hosanna, save now, Lord, save. And you know, I think anybody with a sincere heart that would cry out that, looking to the Lord for salvation, he answers that. But I think the problem is, sometimes people are looking for him to come on the white horse, though. And sometimes he comes very meekly, very humbly on the colt. You know? But either way, he will come. He will save. I'm just thinking of some of the things, you know, that go on. And some of the things that are, are, are not illegal, but just bondage to themselves. The one that I'm thinking of is this simple thing, credit card debt, that I know so many people can get caught up in. Well, you know, or, or you do that, you go in that direction, you're spending money that you don't have, but sooner or later, you've got to pay for that. Sooner or later, that bill comes due. And that's hard when you have dug a hole so deep. I mean, isn't, I, I suppose the Lord can do that. Throw thousands of dollars in your direction. But typically, you know, that would be the white horse coming, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, suddenly a check showed up. We had that happen once. $3,000. $3,000 check. Had no idea it was even coming and it showed up. That was quite a thing. That was quite a blessing. And that was very helpful at the time it came. But often what the Lord wants in a situation like that would be just to get your house in order. And you start paying off that debt. And you, you go through a, a time of um, you know, fasting or reduction and where your attention is put on your finances. And there's many other areas of life where that can happen. But the Lord isn't going to come and rescue immediately. He's trying to teach us something. I remember my son Matthew. He had... I think it was $25 for food. And I think the period of time was 70 days. That's not much food. That's not much money to buy food for 70 days. But he, he had overextended. He had got himself a little bit um, because of repairs that his house needed. He was a single guy. So I'm all for it. Go starve. That's good for you. I did not bail him out. Although, if he showed up and wanted something to eat, I'd feed him. Because, as we prayed about that, we knew God was doing something in his life. He got through that 70 days with $25 for food, and you know what? He's still alive. It didn't kill him. And sometimes trouble's a good thing, and sometimes the Lord will allow those things. Natural consequences to occur and to allow us to work through those things. I didn't like seeing him go through that. It happened with my other son, Justin, as well, you know, where he's paying his rent. He and a, a friend had rented an apartment, but they really couldn't afford it. Um, money was tight, and, you know, something breaks on the car or, or, or whatever it was, you know, these bills that are unexpected. But that's what he would do. He would show up at mealtime. We always knew when... Uh, the food had run out because he would show up for dinner. You know, oh, what you having for dinner? That was it was real easy for him to ask, and real easy for us to say, Why don't you join us? You know, I help him out. Now I could have gone and I could have spent, you know, I could have got some grocery cards or spent a couple hundred dollars even on food, take it over. But the same idea. God was showing him things. And there's times in life where the Lord will do that. Just want to take you through things. Times of trouble. So that he can prove himself faithful. So he can show us stuff. Um, what's that verse? Don't despise the days of what? It's short things anyway. Of, of what? Salvation. 
small things, small things, you know, the day of small things. Don't despise it. There are those days where things just are, don't despise it. God will show you things through those times. Although I'm glad, hopefully I'm never going through another one. I don't want them. I don't like it. I like it when things go well. I, I really do. But here in the triumphal entry of Jesus, we have the prophecy from Zechariah 9 that was fulfilled with the, the donkey sitting on the donkey. We have the people crying out Hosanna in the highest. But the other one that's not really written here, but that is certainly a prophecy that was fulfilled is Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. It's the 70 weeks prophecy. 70 weeks have been determined for my people Israel. That's what the prophecy was. That's, well, we can go there. Matthew 20. I mean, Daniel 9, 24. That way I can read it to you exactly what it says. I can turn the pages back. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. It says this, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. To the end of it shall be with a flood. And till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consum consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So that's the, that's the vision. That's the entire vision given to Daniel, the prophecy given to him. And what we find in verse 25, he says that. Know and understand from the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Just Jerusalem had been destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar had come in, taken the captives back to Babylon, and the city had been utterly destroyed. But after Daniel's time, after this was written, um, a command was given. It was, let me see, the date was March 14, 445 B.C. Artaxerxes gave the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So we have a starting point in the fulfillment of that prophecy. It's 445 B.C. Now you do the math, 69 weeks is what it said, 7 weeks and 62 weeks, 69 weeks. Um, it comes out to 483 years. So you calculate from March 14, 445 B.C., you go ahead 483 years. And that's what the prophecy said. That's when Messiah will come. That's when he will enter Jerusalem. That's what we're talking about. So do the math. And if you figure it out, and um, let me just read that to you, what I have here. It says, Sir Robert Anderson, in his book, The Coming Prince, has commute, computed from the command from Artaxerxes to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which happened on March 14, 445 B.C., he has calculated 483 years from that date, 69 times 7, using the 360-day Babylonian calendar, which gives you 173,880 days. And when you figure it out, it takes you to April 6 in the year 32 which was precisely the day Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. That's a pretty precise prophecy, isn't it? 173,880 days. And you've got a starting point, March 14, 445 B.C. 
and he plot it all out, and that's where it comes to, which is when he came. That's why when you look at it in Luke, when Luke relates the triumphal entry in Luke 19, in verse 41, something that Matthew did not include, but Luke included, as Jesus was drawing near the city of Jerusalem, as he's riding on this donkey, on, on this little colt of a donkey, we have here verse 41 of Luke 19. It says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you especially this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus expected that they would know when he was coming. Because it was spelled out in that prophecy in Daniel. Very clearly. Now, there's some calculation variation. You could look at it in different ways. But either way, however you're going to look at it, you got maybe a three, four, five year leeway there. They should have been looking for them. They may not have had the precise date of April 6, 32 AD. They may not have had that exactly. But he's weeping because they weren't prepared. They didn't know he was coming. And even as he was coming, so he is coming. Now, he told us, as far as his second coming, no man knows the day or the hour. We don't know when. But he does give signs. He got, does give things to look for. And we'll get into that when we get into Matthew 24, so that's a few weeks away. But I gotta tell you, those signs, you can read them in the newspaper, you can watch them on the news programs, they are evident that we're in that time. And we should be looking for the soon return of Jesus Christ. We should be preparing for that. As he came, so he will come again. You know, as he ascended in Acts, he said, you know, two angels appeared to the disciples and said, why are you standing there looking up? Jesus went up out of sight. He said, the same way he went, he's coming back. He's coming in the cloud. He's going to come back someday, and someday soon. So don't stand there looking up that way and doing nothing. No, get yourself back into town. Wait until you're due with power on high, but there's work to be done. Get back to town. Get busy. And so it is with us. Prophecy, so much fulfilled on this one day. In this one passage of scripture. In verse 10 it says. Back in Matthew 21. And when he had come into this Jerusalem. All the city was moved. Everybody was aware. You know he didn't sneak into town. Everybody knew. Here he is. He's coming. And so who is this? This is Jesus the prophet. Of, from Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12 says, Then Jesus, I mean, first thing you do, what are you going to do when you come into town? Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He's going in and clean the house. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So not only is he just not sneaking into town, he's going in and poke a hornet's nest. That's what he does. He's stirring things up. But rightfully so. You see, the way the temple was set up, you've got the Holy of Holies, and then you've got the next court, which is where the sacrifices are made, then the next court where the men could go in, then another court where the women could go in, and then you had this outer court that was the court of the Gentiles. That's where people were buying and selling. 
That's where the Pharisees and Sadducees are making their money. Because outside, you'd buy a bird for like two bucks, say. The, the rate inside would be like 30 bucks. It'd be like going to, to the ballpark. You been out of Fenway lately? Get a hot dog there. Well, last time I went, it was 12 bucks, and that was six, eight years ago. It's probably $20 now. Something you can go right over to Hannaford and get for, you know, five bucks. You can get a whole pile of them, you know. <laughs> but you go in there and get one. The same idea. Inside the temple, you need a dove to offer. Cost you 20 bucks for something you can get for two dollars on the outside. I mean, is that kind of exorbitant increase? And they're just making money hand over fist. And Jesus goes in, turns the tables over, and drives them out. Because that area was intended as a place where we Gentiles could go in and pray. A place that's as close as we could get to the Lord. All these other barriers. You know, when we get to the end of this book of Matthew, it says all those barriers, you know, that veil, it was torn from the top to the bottom. God said, no, no more barriers. Come on in. Well, that's the good news. But still, here and then, for another week or so, a lot of barriers to prayer. A lot of barriers for us as Gentiles, even. And this house should be called a house of prayer. And you know, whenever we look at the temple, I always think of that verse in Corinthians, know you not, that you, your body is the temple of the Lord. See, this temple, this should be a house of prayer too. We need to be people of prayer. I want to invite you again Wednesday nights, if you can, to come. That's when we pray as a church. It's a good time. We spend half hour or so looking at Scripture, and then a half hour or so in prayer. Um, and we were talking with uh, a guy Friday night. Told him, "Look, you can come if you don't want to pray. Just say pass. Nobody's gonna, you know, we're not gonna hit you with a taser or something. Make you try to pray or something. I hope, you know, it's okay if you don't. But you know, I think it's it's one of those things. Sadly, everywhere you go, anybody you talk to, a prayer meeting is the least attended service." in any church. And you want to know why America is the way it is? There's not enough prayer. We need to be crying out to God. When you see things like we're seeing things, it's good to get together and pray. Corporate prayer, I don't know how it works. I know in Scripture it says that one can put a thousand a flight and two ten thousand. I don't know how that math works with God, but you know, the more people are here, the more damage we can do to the kingdom of the enemy. And I just like to do that. I like to get together and pray. And God moves. God will do things. But this temple, your temple, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Prayer should be a part of what goes on in our temple. You know, what we should be doing. See, Jesus, one day, he made a triumphant entry into my life. And I became the temple of the Holy Spirit. I became that. You became that. And that's what it means to be. Some... Uh, a place that honors God. That's what our, our lives need to be. So anyway, he goes in, he turns everything over, he messes everything up, and he drives them all out and says, it should be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. After he did that, see the then, verse 14, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. Once he cleaned it out and made room for them, they were able to come in. And it says, and he healed them. <laughs> But then our buddies, the chief priests, they were real happy with that. You know, it says, verse 15, when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. And the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. Isn't that amazing? And said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. <laughs> Have you never read out of the mouth? of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. So yeah, yeah, I, I hear what they're saying, yes. They're saying praise to God and they're calling me God and yes, that's who I am. I'm receiving the praise of the people. Here's another place where Jesus declaring 
by his actions, by his statements, that he is 100% God, even as he is 100% man. What a crazy thing. Wonderful things. What are they so incensed at? Not that he did the wonderful things. I think they were okay with that. What they hated was that all the people were following him. It was the jealousy, the envy that they had. That's why they hated him. Because all the things they were doing didn't give them the fame, the acclaim that Jesus was receiving. And so they were trying any way they could to undermine him. Save now, Hosanna to the son of David. Knowing that that was from Psalm 118. Knowing that they were declaring that he was the Messiah. That's what the people were crying out, thinking praying, hoping, saying that he was the son of David, the promised one, the one that was to come. And so they're crying this, which offended greatly the leaders, the chief priests, wanting them to stop and wanting Jesus to stop them. And he said, no, nope, no way. Yep, I hear him. And it's perfect praise. That's what it is. They perfected praise. And so the day ends. This first day, he left the city, went out, and went back to Bethany, where he stayed that night. And that's where we'll leave it for today. You know, just thinking about how glorious a thing, that triumphal entry. When we bow our hearts, bow our heads, bow our uh, being to the authority of Jesus Christ. What a glorious day that was for me. What a glorious day, I'm sure, for you to know that. To know that he is Lord. To know that he came and paid the price. He bought our freedom. He redeemed us. No more guilt. No more sin. All paid for. All done. All gone. What a glorious thing. What a wonderful Lord. We should praise him. As they did. Well, let's uh, let's all stand. We'll close with hymn 379. Take my life and let it be.
desire that you, Lord, would be Lord. Lord, help us to submit our will to yours. Thank you, Lord, for coming. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross. And Lord, as we go from here, we pray, Lord, that you would just fill us with your spirit to overflowing, that you would empower us to be your witnesses, and Lord, that you would help us in all things to just honor you. Bless us, Lord, now as we go, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, bless you. Bless you. Oh, my God.